Majora's Mask. Chapter 43. The Western Shore. A breeze came through the sister's open window, still heavy with the shadow of midday's rain. The sun had almost set, and Romani and Kremia could be heard laughing together near the barn. Stinky neighed alongside them. The small family spent the evening content in one another's arms. Link sat in the second-story guest bedroom holding his ocarina. He was fully equipped with his bag, sword, scabbard, and shield. Only his long-lost hat remained missing. Tattle floated beside him, eyeing the instrument's new scorch marks. Mm, it should be fine, the fairy said. Much of the burnt clay had flaked off as the hero picked at it. Only the Skull Kid's mark refused to heal itself. Mm, maybe, Link said. He couldn't forget the Gorman brothers' act of malice. What if kicking the ocarina into the fire had destroyed its magic? <laughs> That'd be our luck. The boy thought. Tattle remained confident. If it can take a blast of lightning from the Skull Kid, then a measly little fire pit shouldn't hurt it. Maybe, Link said. Why are you so upset? She asked. We just saved Romani, and you were happy until, like, five minutes ago. Link kept turning the instrument over in his hands rather than replying. I know the whole ghost thing was upsetting, but compared to everything else we've been through, it's almost like a walk in the park. That ghost didn't hurt you, did it? When it reached inside of you? No, Link said immediately. It's not that. I felt its fingers close around whatever they took out of Ingo, but they didn't take it out of me. Did you notice they shoved his light in a lantern? The fairy nodded. On the last cycle, Romani wandered back with a lantern, too. But that never happened this cycle. Mission accomplished. We should be happy. We saved her. She's not an emotionless husk that's forgotten everything. That evil Gorman brother is instead. But the other one kicked my ocarina into the fire. If you're so worried about it not working, why don't you play the Song of Time right now? I still have to help Kremia deliver milk to Clocktown tonight, Link said. And besides... It doesn't matter if we play it now or later. It's either broken or it's not. We'd still end up dying if the moon falls. Tattle's sarcastic quip was ready to go. Not if we set fire to that dam again and hide behind the rocks. Link raised an eyebrow. You really can't help yourself, can you? Tattle sighed. Why don't you actually tell me what's bothering you instead of us playing 32 questions? Link returned his attention to his instrument. When he kicked my ocarina into the fire, and it hurt me. Uh, it hurt me too, Deku Head. That's our only ticket to surviving the apocalypse. No, it hurt me, physically, after it landed in the fire. He put his hand over his chest scar. Tattle followed his meaning. Why would that hurt you? That mark is from the Skull Kid. The great fairy said there is light and dark in me, Link said. Not just the darkness from the Skull Kid. You think the ocarina's magic is the other half of it? Tattle said. Uh, it's probably not half, significantly less, but yes. Tattle frowned. I don't understand how the ocarina worked some of its magic into you. Was it from playing the Song of Time too much? No, Link said. Because of this, he gestured to the black mark again. We were both struck at the same time, remember? The lightning bolt connected the three of us, Majora, me, and the ocarina, and it marked and bound us all together. Tattle nodded uncertainly. You're speaking of the ocarina like it's a person. It's not a person, he said, but the ocarina clearly has some magic power of its own, I think the Skull Kid's lightning accidentally combined the Ocarina and Majora into one mark. One curse. Light and dark. Inside of you? 
Link nodded again. That would explain everything the great fairy said. This should be good news, though, right? Tattle said. Why are you so upset? Link narrowed his eyes. Wouldn't you be upset if you found out you were constantly bound to things? First, I'm bound to Majora and have some dark curse in me. Now, I'm bound to my ocarina with some light curse thing, which means I guess when my flute gets hurt, so do I. And in Hyrule, the sages gave me a grand destiny and a magical sword. I don't know. <sighs> I don't like the idea of being tethered to so many things. I just want to be me. I don't want a battle between light and darkness inside of me. Especially when it turns me into something so terrible. Tattle had described it to him many times, and through the Skull Kid's eyes, Link had seen it himself. The monster he became, with purple eyes, white hair, and a gray tunic. <sighs> Besides, Link continued, that's only part of what makes me upset. The other part is that Dark Link probably has the ocarina's magic inside of him, too. We guessed that he could travel back in time with us, but if I'm right about this part, too, then... He is part light and part dark. If he's as connected to the ocarina as I am, then we've lost our only advantage. We'll manage, Tattle said. The ocarina barely gives us an advantage over the Skull Kid, and we've still managed to survive all his attacks. This dark Deku head thing won't be any different. I certainly hope so, Link said. Link grasped the jar of milk firmly, lifting with his legs as he carried it into the wagon. The jug joined the others in the caravan, and then he drew the tarp over the opening. Is that the last one? He said. Yes, Kremia said, pulling a final buckle tightly over Stinky's reins. Romani ran from the barn with Tattle by her side. Romani's gonna take our milk to Clock Town, too. Actually, you're looking after the place, Kremia said. The cows will be all alone otherwise. And after what happened last time... She turned to the fairy. Are you sure you don't mind staying here while we're gone? Of course not, Tattle said with a frown. Babysitting over-energetic children is my favorite pastime. I'm not a baby, Romani said. Right. Tattle and I are glad to help out any way we can, Link said. We appreciate the meals and the bed because we don't always get those things. Kermia smiled. You saved my sister and my entire farm. I think I'm the one who'll owe you more favors after all this is done. You two are always welcome here. Until, Until the, the poor, poor shadow, shadow forgets all, all of this once, once you, you play, play the song of time, time, the mask salesman said, a phantom voice echoing across Link's mind. He hated this recent development. His intrusive thoughts had been difficult enough before they were given a personality. The hero climbed into the front of the wagon beside Kremia regardless. We'll be back late tonight, the ranch owner said. Thanks again, Tattle. Tattle flashed them her most disingenuous smile. Oh, anything for the owner of Chateau Romani Village, home to the Romani bread cows, who definitely won't succumb to a magical time spell and forget all about us. Link's face flushed red, but neither sister appeared to pay her comment much attention. Stinky took his first hoof step forward, and then the heels rotated and creaked as they carried them to Clocktown. The fairy remained alone with Romani as they watched the wagon vanish. Their small dog sat next to them as well, panting and wagging its tail excitedly. Tattle side-eyed the dog and girl, waiting for them to make the first move. What was that about a magical time spell? Romani said. Tattle sighed. Don't worry your silly little head about that. So, what now? Do I give you a bubble bath, change your nappy? Romani stared at her with an oblivious smile. Do you like Grasshopper? She asked, completely ignoring the fairy's sarcasm. Yeah, Tattle said. Of course. We annoy each other a lot, but it's all in good fun. I haven't actually hated him in a long time. No, I mean like him. Like, really like him? Wait, what? Tattle balked. She waited to see if the little girl was joking, but her shining eyes looked dead serious. 
Romani, he's a human and I'm a fairy. That doesn't that doesn't make sense. You can't a, a, a fairy and a fair a, a human and a fairy can't love each other like that. Why not? Romani asked as her smile faded. Because that's just Tattle trailed off, struggling to find the right word. <laughs> Weird! People don't do that! Fairies don't do that! So you don't lock him. Tattle could hear the disappointment in her voice. <sighs> but she's just a kid, the fairy thought. She doesn't know any better. Not like that. People don't think that way. <laughs> How could something like that ever work? And besides, even if we were the same species, it's... We're not the same. That possibility never even crossed my mind. We'd kill each other before the first week was over. Romani considered that. Have you ever been in love before? Tattle hadn't expected that question either. Nehru, save me from this child, she thought. Not that I can remember. It's always been just me and Tail, my brother. Can a shadow feel love like that anyways? Tattle thought. She resented that question as soon as it came to her, but a pit in her stomach formed anyways. What if all her memories with Tail were illusions? What if Romani kept asking her questions and eventually Tattle went mad when the wrong one faced her to confront Termina's illusions? Would I cease to exist? If someone cuts through enough of the lies, will I disappear forever? Or would she remember being Navi? No. She thought. Stop it. You don't even know if you're really her. That's just what the mask salesman said. Are you sure? Romani asked, snapping Tattle from her train of thought. Everyone falls in love. I don't know if I believe you. Then don't believe me. Tattle said. See if I care. The wagon rolled noisily down the forest path, but thankfully the journey was much less painful this time. Not long ago, a lethal wound in Link's stomach had made the rough venture nearly impossible. Night had arrived, and the air was cool, carrying starlight between holes in the tall forest tree's canopy. Stinky pulled them along as Link and Kremia sat together at the wagon's front. The jugs of milk remained safely behind them, secured by enough straps to prevent bouncing around. Termina Field was beyond the distant tree line, shrouded in chirping insects and swaying grass. Kremia eventually broke the silence. I'm glad you came with me. I think it would have been rather lonely without company. I know the feeling, Link said, his back against the wagon's exterior. Kremia handled the reins all on her own. How long have you and your sister been alone? A while, Kremia said. Her eyes remained watchful on the road, despite the heavy topic. After our dad died, I've tried to take care of the ranch without help, but things have been unstable lately. The cows always seem bothered, and I've found broken bottles everywhere. I guess we know who's been doing that now. I hope the Gorman brothers don't come back for a while, and the cows can finally go back to normal. I can't believe they were almost stolen, and that Romani thought ghosts were responsible, of all things. <laughs> Link listened carefully. He allowed Kermia to continue filling the space between words. I'm really glad you wandered by when you did, the ranch owner said. I don't know what I would have done without you. Link smiled. They allowed the silence to return briefly, and the hero relished the warm night's wind as it tussled his hair. What are townsfolk saying about that moon? Kermia asked. It's bigger than before, isn't it? I don't know, Link said. The town's been getting emptier. I think people are leaving. I hope my friend in town is okay. Her name is Anju. Anju, Link thought. They'd become friends on multiple clock town cycles, but they'd only become close on one when the Skull Kid had killed her. She's coming back to the ranch with Kremia tonight, Link knew, recalling the time loop's pattern. Unless everything Tattle and I did this cycle changes that. The day after tomorrow was supposed to be her wedding, Kremia said. Does anybody actually know what happened to Café? Link asked. He recalled his promise to Anju as she'd lain on the ground dying. Even though the hero knew the innkeeper, he knew next to nothing about her fiancé, 
except that he was the mayor's son. You know Café? Crimea asked. Din, Link thought. He shouldn't have mentioned Café's name. No, Link said uncertainly. I just heard rumors when I passed through town about Anju and Café, and I visited the inn before coming here. Crimea was clearly skeptical, but she didn't press the matter. No one knows what happened to him. She laced her next response with disdain. He just left her. Link wasn't sure what to add, so he said nothing. Crimea returned her attention to the moon. I wonder if it will fall, that thing. I don't know. Link lied again. The caravan wheels finally came to a stop outside Mr. Barton's bar in East Clocktown. The guards had approved their cargo, and they'd encountered no one else on their journey through the village. Kremia and Link stepped down into the plaza as Stinky buzzed his lips. Before they began unloading jars, Kremia retrieved something from the wagon that wasn't milk. This isn't much, but please accept my thanks, she said. Thank you, Link, for everything. Kremia held a mask. It was a cow's face complete with a pink snout and monochromatic wooden fur. This mask is only given to a limited number of customers. It's proof of membership at Mr. Barton's. You can get a discount on milk whenever you bring this with you. This is incredible, Link said, slipping Romani's mask into his bag and bringing the grand total to five. Thank you so much. The hero looked up to see someone approaching them from across the plaza. Anju, the innkeeper had exited the stockpot inn and immediately noticed them. Kremia? She said. Anju! The two friends met halfway and hugged. Link stood behind them and watched their reunion, smiling until the innkeeper looked at him like a stranger. Right, he thought. It never got easier every time she forgot him. You managed to get the milk ready in time for the carnival after all? Anju said. <laughs> yes, she exclaimed. All thanks to Link. So, this is the hero? The innkeeper asked. His arrival earlier that day had caused quite the commotion, as he had come and left with several guards. Word of his efforts at Romani Ranch had spread, despite few townsfolk remaining. Kermia nodded. Link, this is Anju. Hi, Anju. Link found it hard to conjure a smile. It's nice to meet you. Anju's smile fell, and her eyes widened. She took a step backward, looking at Link as if he'd done something wrong. Link's heart leapt. Does she remember? He tried to restrain his glimmer of hope. Kremia noticed the change, too. Is everything okay? I think so, Anju said uncertainly. I, I just... Could you come inside for a moment? My mom and I were actually wondering if we could go to the ranch today, instead of tomorrow. Sure. Kremia turned to Link. Do you mind? We'll just take a second. No, that's fine, Link said, forcing himself to push aside his curiosity. I'll go grab another jar. He waved at them as he went across the plaza and delivered the milk. Kremia and Anju then went back to the stockpot inn, crossing from the cool night into the warm lobby. They stepped in front of the desk. Anju held her hands together as she searched for the right words. Kremia spoke first. What was that about? Do you know him from somewhere? It did seem odd when he told me that he knew Café. What? Anju asked. He, he knows Café? At least a little bit. Maybe just his name, but I thought he was brand new to Clocktown. The innkeeper considered before finally shaking her head. That doesn't matter right now. It's nothing like that. It's just... <sighs> she sighed. This is going to sound really odd. Last night, a visitor came by the inn. I don't have any idea who he was, but he seemed really desperate. Hurt, almost. And I wanted to trust him. He sounded sincere. Kremia didn't understand where this was going. What did he say? He asked me to deliver a package to someone, but he didn't give me the person's name. At first, I thought the boy outside is who he was describing. That's why I was a little surprised, but it can't be him. Why not? Because he wasn't wearing a green funnel-shaped hat. 
Anju said. The man told me to give it to a boy with a hat like that whenever he passes through. When I first saw him, I saw his green tunic. He wasn't ever wearing a hat, was he? No, Kremia said, still confused as the innkeeper led them up the stairs and into her room. But do you still have the package? Maybe he lost his hat. No, I don't, Anju said. That's the thing. The inn was robbed. Kremia turned to her shocked as they sat down on her bed. When? When the carts were all being gathered to go to your ranch, I went out to see what was going on, and while I was out, someone stole all our money. Her keys, that package, all of it. She tried to withhold her tears, and Kremia put an arm around her. I'm sorry, Anju. You should come to the ranch tonight and bring your grandmother and mom. It looks like a bunch of other people have taken shelter, too. Anju nodded. Thanks. That is all really odd, though, Kremia said. A stranger leaves a package, and then someone steals it the next day. Did you ever see what was inside of it? No, but I wasn't the only one robbed when the guards came. It was that thief everyone's been talking about. I know that boy was helping you by getting all the guards, but it gave the thief a chance to strike again. Kremia's shoulders tensed at the thief's mention. Do you remember what the man who gave you the package looked like? <laughs> no, Anju said. He wore a black cloak and kept his face covered. Tattle couldn't believe her brother's incompetence. Tail, stop! We don't know what's over there! Yes, we do, Tail said. The morons! We have to hurry before they leave! They flew over Snowhead's mountains towards the Goron's isolated village. The ground was thousands of feet below them. Tail, that's stupid! The White Fairy said. What do we want from the Gorons? It's just something to do, her brother said. We haven't been over there in a while. Tattle! This time, it was a Skull Kid's voice. Why are you following your brother? Tattle spun around. And there he was, staring at her with Majora's eyes. I need to make sure he doesn't do anything stupid. I think you're too late. The fairy couldn't look at the imp any longer. The demon's voice made her want to cry. However, they were no longer in the sky. She saw her brother groveling in ashes. Goron village was destroyed. He held a knife in his hand, raising it to his neck. He screamed until his throat was raw. Tattle flew as fast as she could to save her brother. She passed over the toppled huts and Goron corpses. One dead hand curled out of the black field as if reaching for her. Tail, no! Stop! Please! No! Tail kept screaming, bringing the blade closer. He kicked his legs in the ashes and pleaded for release. But no matter how fast Tattle flew, the space between them only grew. Then, Tattle reached him, but Tail was already gone. I told you, <laughs> you were too late. Tattle couldn't stop the tears as she turned around again, expecting to find the Skull Kid. Instead, she found Link. His eyes were glowing purple, his tunic was a dull gray, and his hair was starkly white. And now, you will join him. Link raised his hand, and violet flames soon rushed toward her. No! She awoke to find Link standing over her, looking worried. Tattle. She panted, overwhelmed by the sweat on her brow and the fading images. She flew away from Link, backing into the bedroom wall. The room was dark, lit only by the stars pouring in from the shut window. Kremia's barn was shrouded in shadow outside. Slowly, Tattle's surroundings became clearer. What's wrong? Link asked, still fully dressed. He must have just returned from his errand with Kremia. I, I, I don't... Um... Tattle looked around, confused as she cried. Words failed her. 
so she simply flew up to Link's shoulder and hugged him. The hero gently placed a hand over her and sat down on the bed. Tattle sniffled. <laughs> you, you won't ever leave me, right? You promise? Tattle, of course not, Link said. I'd never leave you. She wanted to believe him, but the words of the masked salesman and the eyes of the dark killer within Link's chest told her otherwise. They sat there together in silence until Tattle spoke again. Link? Yeah? When she opened her mouth again, Tattle didn't know what to say. Whatever complex emotion, question, or thought she wanted to express could not be put into words. Instead, all she mustered was, Thank you. Link responded by holding her closer. Words were not needed after all. Link and Tattle decided to stay with Kermia on the final day. There wasn't time to do anything else productive, and they'd wanted the extra rest. Kremia and Romani had happily obliged, though Anju and her grandmother joined them as guests too. Link spent his day riding a Pona, while Tattle spent it reliving her horrible dream. She never summoned the courage to share her newfound fears with the hero. The moon remained a silent observer to it all, steadily growing closer to Clocktown as the sky bled redder. Fear became overwhelming for Kremia, even though Romani still rejoiced in their victory. Her little sister looked forward to the carnival tomorrow, and Kremia could barely fight back the feeling of dread. I can't tell her, Kremia thought as she eyed the menacing rock. With growing certainty, the owner of the ranch decided there would be no tomorrow. But Romani doesn't have to know that. It was a burden she would carry alone. After saying his goodbyes to Anju and her grandmother, Link and Tattle ventured to the barn outside. Link wasn't sure what to expect when he opened the doors to say his last farewell. Kremia's been acting so scared all day, he knew. The cows mooed in greeting. The barn ceiling was still a gaping hole, open to the nightmarish final hour sky. Kremia sat on a crate next to one of the cows, and Romani stood nearby too, smiling broadly at her friend's return. Grasshopper! Romani said. Oh, good evening, Kremia said with much less enthusiasm. Her hollow ringed eyes had not changed. She was already in mourning. Her milk in the cows tonight, Romani said. It's Chateau Romani. It's the first time I get to drink it. Really? Link asked, stepping fully into the barn. Romani nodded enthusiastically. Until now, my sister always said, wait until you're an adult, but... She stopped when confusion flashed across her face. Well, now... Kremia chose her words carefully. You've become an adult now, Romani. I see that in you now and want to celebrate it. The ranch owner mustered as much sincerity as she could. Then does Romani get a mask too? The young girl said, smiling again. Of course, I'll make one for you. Romani ran into her sister's arms, hugging her tightly. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you! I love you, Kremia! She said. Kremia returned the hug and hid her tears. <laughs> Sleep with me in my bed tonight, okay, Romani? Mm -mm. Yes, sister. Link met Kremia's watery eyes from afar. He nodded, as did she. Then he turned to leave the barn. That was so sad, Tattle said. I know, Link said. That's why we keep fighting, for people like them. Kremia continued holding her little sister. The ground shook violently again, causing the barn to creak. Kremia closed her eyes, holding Romani even tighter. Link shielded his eyes from the light of the first day. Eventually... They adjusted, and Link was once again in a termina that had reset. My ocarina worked, he thought. Thankfully, the Gorman brother had not damaged it in the fire. He looked at the hurrying townspeople blankly, and then at the fairy who'd joined him. 
Tattle gave him a sympathetic look, but he knew there was nothing new to say. We've been here too many times to count, Link thought. Out of habit, Link opened the clock tower doors and peered inside. No one was there. The cogs turned, echoing across the empty room along the waterway. Link allowed the doors to close behind him, and then looked back at Tattle. Do you think Epona's out there? He asked. There's only one way to find out, she said. Link crossed the south clock tower plaza to the gate, and after a small confrontation with the guard, he passed through the stone passageway to enter Termina Field. Epona stood nearby in the exact spot where he'd played the Song of Time. She neighed in delight at his return, and Link smiled, running up to hug her around the neck. It worked, he said. Finally, he'd kept another promise, keeping his horse safe. And I promise to keep you that way as long as I can, Link thought. It was these small victories that kept him going. The hero addressed his companion with confidence. Are you ready? He asked. Yep, Tattle said. Are you stocked up on everything you need? Yeah, I got the silver rupee from the knife chamber again last cycle. Bought some arrows, food, and water. I think that's about everything, right? Seems like it. Tattle said. Onward to part three, then. Or twelve, if I'm being honest. These side adventures of yours keep getting longer and more exhausting. Link smiled. Hey, you missed out on the entire last temple. You've got catching up to do before you're allowed to be exhausted. Tattle rolled her eyes. With any luck, there won't be another temple. Maybe this giant's captor will be chilling on the beach with a glass of Chateau Romani, and we won't have to do anything but ask nicely. Ew, Link said. A glass of milk on the beach sounds disgusting. I hate this stuff no matter where I am, she said, looking onward. Shall we go westward, fairy boy, to the hopefully milkless beachside paradise? Link nodded. As much as I never want to go to that beach again, I'm ready to get Great Bay over with. The hero climbed his horse, and then they were off. Hepona galloped across Termina Field, and Tattle followed. Grass eventually turned to stone as they passed between two ornate fountains outside the western gate. Two familiar cliff sides were ahead, forming a narrow passageway between them. Thankfully, the path was large enough for his horse. Link led Epona through, and they reached the wall blocking the way forward. He eyed the blue wave painted on its surface as he confidently pushed his steed toward it. Epona leaped over the wall, landing gracefully on the other side. In a few short minutes... Great Bay lay before them. Link hardly recognized it. Last time, the waves had towered monstrously into the sky, and the night had been a terrifying blood red. Now, an early morning sun shone over a gentle current that rocked the beachfront. Its rhythm was steady, alongside the cawing seagulls. The palm trees had not been uprooted, spreading their green fan-like leaves to soak in the warm day. The hero also remembered seeing the remnants of a building near the shore, and now it stood intact, untouched by the moon's devastation. A pier led to a ladder, which ascended to a platform. On the platform, a round metal building stood with a singular window and door. A rather large hook, with no obvious purpose, protruded from its top. Epona's steps became muffled by sand as she slowed down. The beach went on for a while, before reaching the waterline and the strange building's pier. The shore continued on either of Link's sides. On his right, the shore curved around a corner without anything noteworthy. To the left, two buildings had been built into Great Bay's rocky eastern border. A handful of umbrellas and tables littered their front yards, as well as two abandoned boats, which meant their owners likely owned parts of the beach. Link hadn't noticed any of that when he'd completed his five-in-the-morning sprint to save Tattle. He knew eventually going left would bring them to the dam. Well, Tattle said as they took in their surroundings, this definitely beats freezing to death in the mountains, or being here on the final night. Link nodded. No cold and no undead kidnappers, and if Great Bay is nothing but the shore, we won't have to hike around a lot. Don't get too greedy, Tiku Head. Undead kidnappers probably like vacations on the beach just like anyone else, and we'll do plenty of hiking before this cycle's over, I bet. Link shook his head. I'm gonna stay optimistic and enjoy the nice weather. Right, 
Let's see how long that lasts. The hero rowed Epona closer to the shoreline, but she whined when the water drew too close. The boy looked back to the houses now behind them on the shore's beginning. Maybe we should see if someone can watch Epona. He turned to backtrack in that direction, but Tattle called his attention again. Hey, wait! Do you see that out there? Link followed his fairy's gaze. Past the pier and near the platform's legs, a small, pale mass floated in the water. A colony of seagulls flocked around it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be noticeable from so far out. Link narrowed his eyes, but he couldn't make out more details. Hmm, it doesn't look alive, whatever it is. Let's get someone to watch Epona, then we'll check it out. Tattle agreed reluctantly. They crossed the beach to reach the two buildings, which also had a small stone fence close to their doorways. He dismounted Epona and entered the open fence with Tattle. The first building was an empty stone room with one stone doorway. There was nothing in it. It just was large, dark, and empty. The other, though made of stone too, was a furnished building that could serve as a home. A decorative sun sat on its roof, and an open window revealed light. They dismissed the empty building and knocked on the home's door. The man who answered was massive and bald. He had thick, muscular arms and a large stomach, boasting tattoos of blue fish on each shoulder. He looked down on Link from at least two feet higher. Hi, Link said uncertainly, looking up at the imposing man. The fisherman's eyes flickered from the boy to the fairy, and then to the horse in the distance. What are a boy and a fairy doing riding a horse to the ocean? His voice was appropriately deep. We are an odd little party, Link thought. We came to see the beach, he said. And we were hoping to board a Pona here while we did that. I have plenty of money if you have the food and water. He held out a golden rupee, and the man's eyes shined. One hundred rupees, he said. I think you've got yourself a deal. Come on inside. He stepped aside and allowed them to enter. It was as small as it looked. There was a table, a counter, and a hammock. A picture hung on the back wall, though it was weirdly blurry and depicted a tall, red-haired woman. Across from the picture, a fish sat in a small tank. It bobbed in the water, glowing a strange golden light. Link stepped closer to the fish. It had a long tail, two wing-like fins, and an elongated face, unlike any other fish the hero had seen. It treaded water, its tail curling and uncurling. There was something human-like about its gaze. The fisherman, meanwhile, took the lid off a barrel in the corner, motioning Link to join him. The boy looked to see plenty of food to sate Epona for three days. Does this look like it'll suffice? I think so, Link said. Tettle narrowed her eyes. What exactly do you do out here? It's not sautéing horses, is it? Tattle! The hero exclaimed. The fisherman laughed. <laughs> I like the way the little one with wings speaks. The little one with wings? Tattle said. Ah, I'll take it. Beats anyone who calls me a dainty creature of the forest with no mind of her own. Well, if you must know, the tall, powerful fisherman said. I've been catching fish in these seas for, oh, thirty years. Born and raised. Papa taught me everything I knew before he came down with the rot. Used to have a family, but my wife Lupa left me and took my no good son Slarp. But heartbreak only made my fishing arm stronger, better than Papa ever was now. When it comes to catching fish, I'm even better than the Zorus. Lincoln Tattle stood, stunned before the man's autobiography. You named your son Slarp? Tattle blurted. It was a family name, the fisherman said, from his mother's side. And let me guess, his father's side had completely normal names? Tattle said. I wanted to name him Bob. Tattle paused. I won't lie, I prefer Slarp. Link sighed. <sighs> Do the Zoras live nearby? I didn't realize Termina had any. The fisherman smiled. Where else would Zoras be? Yeah, they're in Termina. You know, the name for the whole world. And they live in Great Bay. They're fishing masterminds despite being a bit fishy themselves. We've all had a lot of trouble lately, though. 
because the seawater has gotten so warm. It hasn't helped my fishing at all. Is warm water bad for fish or something? Tattle said. Yeah, but that's not even the whole problem. The water's gotten all murky too, so when I ship out, I always lose my way and somehow end up back at shore. Ah, <sighs> the Skull Kid, Link thought. Of course this place would have a curse just like Woodfall and Snowhead. We fishermen, and even the fish, are in a real predicament. It's been hurting all of us. It actually looks like it killed Zora outside for the first time. You probably saw a flock of seagulls hounding it. There's no help in them now. And things are getting serious if one of them kicks the bucket. That was a Zora? Link exclaimed. You still out there? The fisherman asked. You didn't check to see if they were alive? Tattle said. No, he said. I know a dead fish when I see one. Link pushed away the flash of anger that flared and sprinted from the house. The fairy followed as they ran for the mast floating near the platform. A flock of seagulls still swarmed it. The hero removed his shield, scabbard, and bag, abandoning them on the shore. He went to grab his hat from instinct, but his hands only met air. Link, what if the water's cursed or something? Kettle asked, stopping short of the water. Remember what the fisherman said? It's not, he said, throwing off his boots. I swam in this already to save you, remember? It didn't hurt me then. He waded into the water and then dove in. It was warm and salty, parting easily before Link's breaststroke. The seagulls scattered as the hero closed in on the body. The Zora floated on their back, bobbing in the water. Their skin was a pale bluish green, darker at the ends of their limbs and lighter on their torso. As with all Zora, the creature was mostly human, aside from their coal black eyes, clammy skin, and sharp green fins protruding from their forearms and ankles. Zora was blue spotted and had a long, sharp end to its head, identical in shape to Link's lost long hat. Link slowed to tread water when he reached the Zora. Hey! he said. The Zora did not respond, though the seagulls did as they angrily abandoned their prey. The Zora's head was craned back, eyes closed, and mouth agape. Link grabbed the Zora's arm and began treading back to shore. Their body glided across the water, though waves lapped into Link's mouth as he struggled with the body. The Zora's skin was soft and slippery, and it shone in the sun. Once he was halfway back to shore, the Zora stirred. Somebody, he said weakly. The shore. He's alive! Link realized. We're almost there, he said. Eventually, they pulled the Zora free from the water, dragging him across the wet sand until they were away from the tide. He wasn't particularly heavy. The Zora was tall and lanky, and he was also young and handsome. Soon, he rested on his back, blinking dazedly in the early sun. What happened? Link asked. He knelt beside the Zora but could find no visible injuries. His breathing was shallow and strained, though, and he could barely stir on the land. Somehow, the Zora summoned the strength to speak again. I... I am Mikau of the Zora people. Guitarist in a Zora band. <laughs> he struggled to get each word out. I... I think this is it for me. My final message... <laughs> Mikau tried to lift his head and failed. Link placed a hand reassuringly on his shoulder. It's okay, he said. Just lay here. We'll find something to help you. He turned to Tattle, his hair and tunic still dripping wet. Tattle, can you see if the fisherman has anything? I'll be right back, she said flying off. Link turned back to Mikau. You're going to be fine. <laughs> Will you listen to it? Zora asked, heedless. To what? My final message. Link's instinct was to reassure him again that he'd be fine. But he looked closer at Mikau's chest, which heaved in and out painfully. His eyes barely seemed able to focus, and the hero saw a resigned sadness in them he'd seen before. In Anju's eyes, he remembered. When she died in South Clock Town. Link nodded solemnly. Mikau closed his eyes, content with the hero's response. 
the carnival's beginning soon, you know. He spoke with what little breath remained. We're the ones they're waiting to see. A Lulu, a vocalist. She laid some strange eggs. But she's lost her voice. Nobody can hear her. Link didn't quite follow his talking, but paid attention nonetheless. Zora's always sounded a little less natural outside of water. There was a delayed echo to his aquatic voice, and it didn't help that this Zora was both out of water and dying. In Great Bay, Mikao said, something's been happening. Gerudo pirates, they stole Lulu's eggs. Gerudo pirates? Link remembered the Gerudo tribe from Hyrule. Kenendorf had been born into it, and the desert-dwelling people had inconsistently either supported or condemned the King of Evil's actions. Aside from Ganondorf, they were exclusively women. The same seemed to be true here. Link remembered looking at them through the Skull Kid's eyes. On another cycle, the imp had burned so many of them to death. I went to stop the Gerudo pirates, Mikau said, mustering all the strength he could to finish the story. I got knocked down and... and I don't think I'm going to make it. Tattle's getting help, Link said, pushing away thoughts of the Gerudo for now. If I die like this, I won't be able to rest in peace. Somebody has to rescue her eggs. Mikau somehow managed to lift his head, even as his thin chest weakly pulled in air. He placed a hand on Link's shoulder and looked at him intently. Please. Link! Tattle returned to their side, empty-handed and alone. He said he doesn't have anything for... for Azura. Oh. She paused, radiating a red-hot anger. Link, he's terrible! He's just like Muto! We can't let him watch Epona! We can't let him do anything for us! What are we gonna do? Tattle. Link said, shaking his head slowly. The fairy quickly gathered his meaning and resigned herself to silence. Oh, somebody, somebody, Mikau said, returning his head to the sand. Please, heal my soul. Some. Link's face darkened. He felt the weight of his ocarina on his belt, but he remembered the masked salesman's words, too. Maybe when I'm done with you, I can turn you into a mask, too, and you can join the collection. He thought of the Goron and Deku masks, and he wasn't sure what to do. Someone, Mikau continued, please heal me. Link pulled his ocarina free. He glanced to Tattle, but she offered no guidance. The fairy watched uncertainly. Because there is no right answer here, the boy thought. Here lay Azora, dying a slow, agonizing death, and in Link's hand was the power to end that suffering, though the magic's true nature remained a mystery. The hero watched the Zora's chest rise and fall with life, even if it was strained and short-lived. Then, Link closed his eyes and put the instrument to his lips. He knew the notes. All he had to do was run his fingers exactly as he did before, and the song of healing would come forth, and its magic, either dark or light, would supposedly heal Mikau. Tattle watched as Mikau's frantic stirring calmed before the melody. His eyes fluttered shut, and his breathing slowed. Link continued playing the song with all the grace of a masterful musician. Mikau's fingers twitched as he fell into a deep sleep. Heal my soul, Mikau thought desperately. Please. Somehow, the strange boy's beautiful song told him it was going to be all right. He could hear it in the notes. The smells of Great Bay seemed far away all of a sudden. He turned, and he saw her. Lulu. She was so beautiful. The Zora smiled in his direction, standing with a coy confidence that Mikau could recognize anywhere. 
You're alive. <laughs> she said. Her voice was so beautiful, so sweet. Ha, huh, Lulu, Mikau said, laughing. You can talk. Thanks to you, she said. The notes of that song, they're here, with us. They echoed across the endless plains' vast darkness, but it didn't matter where they were, because Lulu was here. I love you. He said, pressing his face against hers. I love you too, she said, returning the gesture. Come on, they're waiting for us. Mikau looked up to see his other bandmates. Evan, Japas, Tijo. He smiled, bringing his hand down and joining his fingers with Lulu's. They walked hand in hand as the haunting melody faded into oblivion. Once Link finished the Song of Healing, Something fell into the sand. He opened his eyes. Where Mikau had once been, laid a mask. The previous cycle, with 36 hours remaining. He struck a match, lighting the lantern hanging on his wall. The small, closet-sized room illuminated, revealing the desk, chair, and bookshelf. He opened his large sack of loot, flinging it just beside the table. Ah, this was almost too easy, the thief reflected. The man lowered his hood and revealed his bald head. He wore a simple brown cloak, but hopefully, with what he'd stolen, things could change. The thief sat at his desk, pulling stolen objects from his pack. The rupees glistened. Red, gold, silver. He would be a wealthy man in no time at all. With this money... He could finally kidnap the mayor's son and collect on the ransom. Living like a rat would be over. The name Sakan would soon carry more weight than it ever had before. Eventually, his hand found something unexpected in the bag. Oh, the package. Sakan remembered. He'd stolen it from the stockpot inn and had no idea what was inside. He pulled free its brown paper covering, untying the string holding it together. The tissue parted to reveal a strange object. What? Sakan thought in confusion. There'd been no address on the package. He wondered if the innkeeper had intended to mail it, or maybe it had been delivered to her, unmarked. Regardless, the terrifying, mysterious gift was his now. He lifted it from his desk. A re-dead mask. <laughs>